We want to know you in your sufferings and the sufficiency of that grace when things are not going the way that we think that they should. And in all these things, Lord, we are inadequate and we call out to you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm stepping on Cheerios. That's not a new, that's a new thing for me. <laughs> are they? Where are the marshmallow pieces if they're Lucky Charms? I mean, if your kid's going to drop stuff, drop the marshmallows so the pastor can graze while he's... <laughs> we're in 1 Corinthians 15, and we're going to be talking this morning about the importance of the resurrection. That may sound like an understatement, it's because it is. We can't overemphasize the importance of the resurrection, but um, I'm going to get a running start at this. We're talking about a glorified body, uh, uh, something that we can't really comprehend. So let's talk about our bodies now for a moment. Um, I was thinking about fitness fads through the decades, through the ages. And uh, I began in the 1970s, so that's where I started my list. Um, that's the decade I was born into. And I, and I have this vague recollection that jazzercise was a thing. And, uh, and then we kind of got into the 80s, and aerobics classes were the fad. And then, and then towards the middle and end of the 80s, you could buy the VHS cassette tape and take it home and put the gigantic thing in your VCR and do your aerobics at home. Um, in, in the 90s, it was Tybo and Billy Blanks, right? Yeah, some of you some of you starting to remember some of these things. It's all coming back. And then spinning classes, and, and, and spin classes were a thing, spinning. And then the 2000s brought us Zumba. I don't know that the world is really better off because of that, but uh, Zumba was a thing. And then now, I just don't care. I just don't care. I'm at that stage of life where it's like I, I might work out this week. I'll probably go to the pool and swim a couple of times, but I just... It's not such a big deal anymore. And uh, fitness is good. Fitness is valuable. Most of the fad side is about body image. And the reality is we're a culture that cares very much about what is on the outside of who we are. And sometimes we do that at the expense of what's on the inside. We're so focused on the outward, so focused on the physical and on the here and now and I just want to say this morning, there is a difference between stewarding what God has given you versus putting all of your effort into looking perfect, trying to have the perfect physique, the perfect body. I gave up on that a long time ago. Let me get an amen. Amen. Yeah, it's clear that I gave up on that a long time ago. Um, <laughs> my wife and I had this conversation this week. I just won't, I won't bore you with it, but um, thank you. Yes, cake is my favorite. When I, but when I, when I look at the culture, just over my lifetime, um, what it's become, having forsaken the God of our fathers and embraced paganism and hedonism, it's no wonder that we're so consumed with our bodies now because we don't have any hope. As a culture, we don't have any hope of a life to come. See, I, I expect pagans to do what pagans do and to live like they live, but when I see the influence of the culture in the church, well, that's... That's a different thing. We're getting caught up in the value system of the world, and, and nowhere does that show up more clearly than in our neglect of the doctrine of the resurrection. So when we get into all this stuff about fads, and, and I, I want to try to, you know, the, the, the mitigation projects, the mortality mitigation projects that people engage in to, to try to gain eternal life, like having their heads cut off and frozen, like we're going to figure out in 150 years how to reanimate that, that says to me that there's not a lot of hope in the culture. That they're hoping in something that's a, a fantasy. It's, a, it's, a, it's fiction. And we, and we get caught up in that. And, and so what we need to do as the church, we need to get back to the resurrection doctrine. Uh, and, and there's no belief or doctrine, I think, that's more central to or pivotal to our faith than that of the resurrection of the dead. We are not a religion that believes that death is the end. And if there was ever a time that we needed to recapture this doctrine and then hoist it up the flagpole for everybody to see it, it's right now. We need to be proclaiming that you can have eternal life. You can be born again and live forever. So we're going to jump back into 1 Corinthians 15 this morning and pick up where we left off last week. And, and so we, we've just 
15, chapter 15 is so immense, it's so big, and it's so rich, it's hard. You couldn't really preach chapter 15 in one sermon. And so here we are, week two. Uh, we're looking at chapter 15, verses 12 to 34. And Paul, I'll just jump right back in. Paul says, now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? So apparently there were some people at Corinth, at the church in Corinth, who did not believe in a bodily resurrection. And Paul is dismayed, and rightfully so, but because of the incalculable importance of a physical resurrection to our Christian faith. It's, it's an incredible waste of your life to embrace a shadowy pseudo-Christianity devoid of the promise of resurrected, glorified bodies. It is a waste of your time. Either we will experience the resurrection or we will not experience the resurrection. And if there's no resurrection from the dead, go be a Buddhist. Verse 13, Paul says, but if there's no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. See, Paul is a master tactician, logician, and debater. And what he's doing here in this moment is he is anticipating his objector. There's a Latin debate term for this. It's called interlocutor. He's, uh, he's anticipating the objection that somebody will make to his line of argumentation. And in anticipating it, he cuts it, he takes it away from them. He answers it before they can raise the objection, right? He says, so if there's no resurrection, then Jesus is still in the grave or wherever the disciples took his body or wherever the Romans put him. You, you, you pick your conspiracy theory, whichever one you want to adhere to. But at the very least, Jesus is dead. And he's most certainly not alive after having ascended into heaven, now being at the right hand of the Father on high. That, that simply cannot be the case if there's no resurrection of the dead. So you go, hmm, maybe the denial of this doctrine is like a faith that is built on dominoes. Once you tip that first domino, you cannot escape the inevitable collapse of all of it. This is what happens. You take that one out, it all just crumbles so right out of the gate, he's bringing his readers to the logical and unavoidable conclusion of this line of thinking. There's no resurrection from the dead. Well, then you have a useless, powerless, meaningless gospel. Why would anyone put their faith in that? He goes on, verse 15. He says, we're, we're even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he barely didn't raise if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ is not raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then those who've fallen asleep in Christ, those, those who are already dead, they perished. Listen, as if his previous argument wasn't enough, he just keeps building on this. He says, we're, we're false witnesses if there's no resurrection. And remember that Paul, like the other apostles, were testifying to a physically resurrected Jesus whom God raised from the dead, whom they all had personally experienced firsthand. All of them. It's not enough to excuse them on the basis of maybe, maybe they just had bad information. No, they, they were claiming firsthand knowledge of and contact with the post-resurrection Jesus. And so either this happened or it didn't happen. Those are your only options. That's it. So Paul says, if Jesus is still in the grave, then your faith is in vain. It's worthless. It's useless because the resurrection is founded on a lie. But Jesus not only conquered death by his perfect life, he gained the right not to stay dead, which had been the penalty for sin. And he extends that option to those who had put their faith in him alone for salvation. He says, you can have what I have gained. I will give it to you freely if you, if you believe in me, right? So one must also consider those who he, he mentions here had fallen asleep. That, if you, when you see that in the scriptures, is a euphemism for they died. And, and so he's, he's extending that option to those who put their faith in, in him alone for salvation and saying, um, 
either this is true or it's not true. You have to make a decision about this. Uh, Additionally, you have no hope of being reunited with loved ones who have died in Christ if there is no resurrection from the dead. Those people are simply gone forever. It it may as well be Dante's Inferno, Inferno for all, right? Abandon hope, all ye who enter. That's what we're left with. Verse 19, he says, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are, of all people, most to be pitied. This is, this is the logical conclusion of this line of thinking. It, it's that if the, the gospel is ultimately worthless and useless, and it becomes just like all the other religions in the world, invented by mere men. It has no power. There's no truth to it. It's just another system of works to try to gain the favor of some deity somewhere. And and that's a hopeless pursuit. And so here we are. We're putting our hope and our longing and our faith in Jesus based on his resurrection. But Paul says, if there's no resurrection, we're pitiful. I mean, look at us. We're hanging all of our hope on this one reality. And then that reality is not even real. He said, that's pitiful. But verse 20, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. You think, oh man, I, I'm so grateful for those verses in the Bible that start with the word but. Yeah. But God. Yeah. Oh, helpless, hopeless, destitute, unable to save ourselves, but God. Yeah. But God. I love those verses. And, and that's what he says here. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. God did raise Jesus from the dead. Therefore, Jesus is the first fruits of those who are asleep. Again, asleep being the euphemism for death. Stay with me. And we'll unpack the first fruits concept in just a sec. But look at verse 21 and 22. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So we're dealing with the fall of man here back in Genesis 3. We know that uh, Eve sinned first, and we don't know what would have happened if Adam had intervened. Now, some of you heard me share this before in other sermons and other teaching series, but, you know, we have it in mind, cheerio, we have it in mind that that, um, Adam was a quarter mile off, and Eve's there, and she's at the tree, and the serpent's with her, and he's tempting her. And Adam crests that hill, and he sees them. And it's all in slow motion as he's just going, no. Right? When you read the text, he's right there. He's standing with her because it says, and she took and ate and gave to her husband who was with her. He's right there. He never says a word. He never intervenes. He never operates in the calling that God had put on him to be the protector in that moment. It was Adam who abdicated his role of authority when the serpent spoke. And so now in Adam, all die. In other words, physical death came into the world through the sin of our first parents. And now we have to deal with that. We have to deal with that. And Adam... We know that he was the first man, a special creation of God made in God's likeness and image. We know that scripture tells us he was given authority over the creation to manage, to cultivate, and to protect it. We know that he sinned willfully. See, Eve was deceived, scripture says, but Adam sinned willfully. He stood there with full knowledge and knowing exactly what he was doing. And having abdicated his responsibilities, resulting in sin entering the world, that we have to now deal with the fallenness of mankind and death. That's the reality. So you've got the fall, you've got Adam, and then you've got Jesus in the mix here now because he's the last man, not the first man. He's the, he's the ultimate. When I say the last man, he's not the last man to ever live. He's the, he's the finality. He's the, the apex. He's everything. He's the ultimate of what a man should be. He's the son of God being fully man and fully divine. We call that doctrine the hypostatic union. If you've never heard that term before, hypostatic union, you need to do some homework this week. Read some theology. Having given up his rights and willingly having laid aside his divine attributes for a short time while he was on earth, Jesus also sought to manage and cultivate and protect that which he had made. He's the better Adam 
And he never sinned. And he never failed in his responsibilities. And though he was sinless and innocent, he went on to take the weight of sin and the weight of humanity's sins onto himself on the cross. And he cleansed us by his blood and he defeated death and he opened the door to restoration with God. Hallelujah Hallelujah is right. Verse 23, Paul says, but each in his own order. There's an order to this. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. And then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. Did you know that there's an order to the resurrection? First was Jesus. And Paul uses the term for Jesus that he was the first fruits of the resurrection. And that's important because Jesus is the king of the Jews. Not just the Lord of the church, the, the, the head of the body, right? He's the king of the Jews. And, and so they, they would celebrate this festival called First Fruits. It's a celebration of faith and thanksgiving to God for the first fruits of the harvest before they've seen the fullness of the harvest come about. They, they take those first fruits and they offer them back to God in faith and say, this is all we've got so far, but we're giving it back to you because we trust that you're going to provide for us and our needs, right? And Pentecost occurs 50 days later after that Sabbath celebration, and it marks the culmination of the Feast of First Fruits. So, First Fruits is the initial offering of wheat and barley harvest before the fields are ready and ripe. It's this act of faith. I'm giving to God what I have now, trusting Him to multiply so that so I'll have what I need later. Jesus is the first fruits, He's that offering. That, that little that was offered first so that more will come in later, right? In Matthew 27, uh, verse 51, it says, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split, and tombs were opened. Some of you get, you're like, I don't think I've ever read this before. And many bodies of the saints who'd fallen asleep were raised. Old Testament saints walking around Jerusalem coming out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection. And they, these people that had been raised from the dead, the first fruits, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Did you know that? Did you know that when Jesus raised from the dead, a lot of Old Testament saints appeared in Jerusalem? (sighs) Wow. That's like a crazy sci-fi movie. Yeah. Yeah. So Jesus was the first fruits, along with these Old Testament saints who were resurrected at that time as well. And then he says the next resurrection in order is the rapture of the church. And we'll get into that next week because Paul's going to unpack our glorified bodies. Because in that moment, we're going to be changed in an instant. And we'll receive our glorified bodies. It's a tremendous passage. I can't wait. We're talking about all that fitness stuff. I'm I'm not doing any more jazzercise ever. (laughs) It's going to be awesome. And we'll wrap up chapter 15 with that. But in this resurrection... Uh, the rapture of the church, the living and the dead who put their faith in Jesus will be raised and transformed in an instant. And then the third, uh, the third piece of this comes at the ending of the eschaton. That's the Greek word for uh, the ending of the age. At the ending of the millennial reign of Jesus, when those who have died during that period of time are raised and receive final judgment, then all of God's enemies are defeated and subdued forever. So there's an order to the resurrection. And then he says in verse 26, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it's plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. And let me explain what that means. Death is the final enemy. So you go back to verses 24 and 25. There will be death during that thousand-year reign of Christ. That people will still die, even though the world will be returned to an Edenic-like state. That's a utopia with Christ reigning and ruling on the earth. Yet we see in the text of Scripture that wicked hearts will resent His rule and seek to overthrow Him. And after all these things, in that thousand years, King Jesus will put all things under His rule, and He will Himself willingly subject Himself to the Father. That's that's what this means, to to put all things in subjection under him. He's the exception. God's the exception. The Father is not subjected to Jesus. Jesus is subjected to the Father, right? And so 28, when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. 
The relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, it's there. It's there everywhere in Scripture. Sometimes it's under the surface, but it's there. Jesus is the conqueror, presenting the Father, the King of kings, with all that he has subjugated under his rule. And this marks the end of Paul's first response to the objection of the resurrection. And so now he goes to another argument. Watch this, verse 29. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead aren't raised, if there's no resurrection, why are people being baptized on, the, on behalf of the dead? That doesn't make any sense. So apparently, what, what we deduce is that there was some practice that, uh, by some, even in the church, apparently, that involved a living friend or family member being baptized via proxy for somebody who's already dead. It's like there were Mormons before there were Mormons. To be explicitly clear, Paul is in no way condoning this practice. And this is where like the Mormons go to this and they say, see, see, it's, it's a real thing. It's like, yeah, but like, he's rebuking them. And this isn't, this isn't condone. This doesn't say, that's a good thing. You should do that. It's, it's, not, it's not in the text. But Paul's not condoning the practice. He's acknowledging that it was really happening and that people were doing this. But it serves to build his argument because we know that some were doing this very thing. They're being baptized on behalf of the dead. And the inference from Paul is, why would anybody go to the trouble to do that if your dead granny's just dead and there's no life after death? Right? Why would people do this if there's no life after death? So he goes on, verse 30, building the argument. Why, Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Why why are we going to all this trouble to preach the gospel illegally in a Roman Empire that hates our message and hates us? Why are we doing all this if this isn't true? And and we see that Paul and his companions and the other apostles and early Christians were all in danger all the time. He asks, if the gospel's not true and there's no resurrection, why would we constantly put ourselves in danger for the sake of proclaiming that which we know to be a lie? Why would we do that? It makes no sense. He, and he mentions in this context that he contended with wild beasts at Ephesus. And I think this is Paul's cheeky way of referencing the episode in the theater at Ephesus where the riot broke out. Um, at, at the very least, what we know is that Paul was a Roman citizen and Roman law forbade uh, a, a Roman citizen from being subjected to the arena. He couldn't be subjected to the arena because he was a Roman citizen. Um, so, so we talk about these wild beasts and, and I, I think we not meant to take them literally, but figuratively, whatever he's referring to. Uh, I think it was the riot in Ephesus personally. But Paul's daily death that he mentions really was, I mean, imagine you, you wake up in the morning and you know that you could, you're, you're keenly aware that you could die today for preaching the gospel. It's a mental and emotional embrace of this reality that every single day that he stood up to preach Jesus crucified and raised to life could easily be the last day of his life. And he puts the exclamation point on this line of argumentation by telling his readers that if there's no resurrection, don't subject yourself to all this suffering and dying and, and, and dying to self and, and putting yourself in danger. Don't, don't do it. If this isn't real, don't, don't do this to yourself. Go party. Live it up. Eat, drink, for tomorrow you're going to die. And you're just going to stop being. And it's all meaningless. Verse 33 says, don't be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. He's saying, can you believe there are still people in your neighborhood who don't know that there's a God who haven't heard the gospel? I say this to your shame. Paul to the Corinthians, hearkening back to the love feast. Where, remember we talked about this, where many were getting drunk after church at the, at the potluck? He's closing the loop on this topic in the light of eternity. He's saying, quit giving your first and your best of yourself to the world. Stop giving your best to the world. 
As born-again followers of Christ, our first and our best goes to Jesus. He hasn't saved us from our sin to break the power of sin over our lives so that we could be free from the presence of sin forever so that we can go on sinning right now. That's not how this works. That's not the intent and purpose of our God. And then he says that some around them in Corinth, have, have, they don't even have any knowledge of God. He says this to their shame because they, the church, have been tasked with making the gospel known. You remember that commission thing Jesus gave us in Matthew 28? They have been tasked with the great commission, making God and his gospel known. Don't be, listen to me, don't be so consumed with church stuff that you aren't engaging in the church's mission. This, this whole thing exists to make Jesus known to the lost. If we're not doing that, it's like, well, it's a nice club. The guy that gets up to speak every week is a little weird, but it's a nice club. That's all it is. So let's put a pin in this right here at this spot, and we'll finish chapter 15 next Sunday if there is a next Sunday. What does Pastor Mike know that I don't know? Did he get a word from the Lord about the rapture? Is he going to die? No, I'm just saying what the Bible says. You don't know that you have tomorrow. You lay your head down tonight on your pillow and not pick it up again in the morning. You don't know. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. So let me just, let me just wrap us up this morning with a couple of, uh, a couple of scriptures here out of Matthew. I want to read from Matthew, and then I want, to, I want to drive this stake in the ground. I almost said in your heart, so that's, all, that's, that's the wrong picture. I don't want to drive a stake through your heart. I want to drive it in the ground. Okay, I think I got it straight now. Um, Matthew 6, listen to the, what Jesus said in, in verse 19. He said, don't lay up for yourselves treasure on earth. He didn't say money, money is evil. That's not what he said. He said, don't, don't lay up treasure for this life here on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But instead, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Isn't that the better investment? Yeah. You know, well, I could dig a hole in my backyard and put all my gold doubloons in my treasure chest down in the ground, and then somebody could come along and dig that up and take it. Or you, or you could put them in a place where nobody would ever be able to attain, like steal your stuff, which is better. He says, ultimately, where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. This is about our heart, not just the treasure, but, but our, our longing, our, our trust, our faith, our investment. So where's your heart, church? Where's your heart? He goes on in verse 22, he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. What you're, what you're taking in, what you're seeing, what you're, what you're learning, what you're, what you're allowing into your mind, right, that determines whether, you're, whether you're, your body's full of light or whether it's full of darkness. He says, but if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light is to, in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? It's, can, you, can you see do you see clearly through the lens of God's word? Is that the, the lens through which you look at the world? The grid through which things must pass to get into your mind? Is it the word of God? He, he goes on in verse 24. He says, you, you can't serve two masters. Either you're going to hate one and love the other, or you're going to be devoted to the one and despise the other. You, you can't serve God and money or mammon. It's, it's bigger than just money. It's stuff. You can't, you can't serve that and be like, but I love Jesus. It's, it's one or the other. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a binary. Oh, we hate those in our culture, don't we? I, I just want the, I want the, I want to put it all in a blender and just have all, it's like, no, it's either this or this. No one can serve two masters. I hate one or love the other. Is devoted to one or despise the other. You can't serve. It was just, what he's saying is like, who is your authority, church? Who's your authority? Who do you serve? 
Who do you obey? Who do you get your marching orders from? And he keeps going. He keeps going here in this chapter of Matthew. He says, therefore, I tell you, don't be anxious about your life. We get so torqued about what we're going to eat or drink or about our bodies. Didn't we start with that? Didn't we start with bodies? Body image. We're so, we're so up, uptight about our bodies and what we put on. And, and the, wow, that, that, that dress is so last season. And it's like the whole, it's like, what? Look, just stop. Look at, just look at the birds. Just look at the birds for me. I, I sit on my porch and I, I watch the robins sometimes. I've never seen a robin have an anxiety attack going, where's the next worm going to come from? It's crazy. Uh, he says, look at the, watch the birds. They don't sow and they don't reap and they don't gather into barns. But your heavenly father feeds them. Now, aren't you of more value than them? And which one of you, by your anxiety uh, and restlessness, can add a single hour to the span of your life? Nobody. And, and why are you anxious about clothing? Why, why would you be so anxious about that? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't toil or spin. They don't, they don't go to Value Village looking for the best, like, $2 special. Like, I know some of y'all do it. Don't even deny it. All right. don't, they, don't, they don't worry about that. He says, I tell you, even Solomon, the richest guy to ever live, even he was not arrayed or clothed like one of these. The glory of the, 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 the grass of the field, which is alive today and then thrown into the fire, is God not going to clothe you, you of little faith? And he goes on, Jesus says, so don't be anxious and say, well, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? So that, that, the pagans run after that stuff. They worry about that stuff because they don't have any hope of a resurrection. They don't have a hope of eternal life. They've got to be focused on right now. That's all they've got. Don't be like that. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all of these things, God will add them to you. He'll give you what you need. He's going to take care of you. The question here in the text is, are you engaging this world for what you can gain, temporal things, temporary things, or for what you can give, the life-giving gospel? Are we engaging with our neighbors? Are we engaging with our community for what we can get or what we can give? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. Because Jesus wraps this up. He says, so don't be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough anxiety for itself. Trust me, when you get there, you'll see it, right? But... To, to sufficient for today is today. Just deal with today. Because you could wake up tomorrow or you could not wake up tomorrow. You could get into a car accident this afternoon. You could be robbed at gunpoint. Some of you are, are like, I'm not leaving the theater. <laughs> An especially large eagle could snatch you into the air and dash you upon rocks and feast on your entrails. I mean, there are just all kinds of scenarios and just occasionally need to make sure that you're still listening. You are never not going to die. Do you understand? You are never not going to die. And this life was never meant to be the focal point. It's not our home. We are ambassadors of Jesus Christ, representing him, making his gospel message of hope and redemption known to any and all who will listen. Are you engaged in the mission of Jesus? The gospel is a gift not to be hoarded, but to be shared. You see, some, verse 34, Paul says, some have no knowledge of God. No understanding or knowledge of Jesus. No understanding of who he is and what he's done for humanity. They don't have any knowledge of that. They don't even know. And I want to go back to one of Paul's arguments that he made in this section to draw out the application this morning because it's a powerful argument. But the application is really subtle in the text and it's easily missed, especially by us in the church today. Because we, we, we tend to take a lot of things for granted. Um, but remember that Paul's daily death, he talked about, really was a mental and emotional embrace of this reality that every, every single day he stood up to share the gospel in any capacity could have easily been the last day of his life because of the, the stance of the Roman Empire, right? And so he's, he's been relentless in telling us that if there's no resurrection don't subject yourself to all this suffering and dying to self stuff. Just go party and live it up. Eat, drink, tomorrow we all die, right? But the inverse is true as well. And here's where we need to go this morning. If the gospel is real and true, then we ought to go to any lengths possible to make it known. We got to get uncomfortable 
as the people of God, even if it costs us everything, even if it costs us our lives. Some have no knowledge of Jesus. Can you believe that? In the United States today, there are people who don't have any knowledge of Jesus. See, in the American church, we got it backwards as preferences go. We embrace so much of the culture that is actually antithetical to the gospel, and we put Jesus on the shelf, and then we take him down on Sunday, and we say some words to him, we sing a song or two, we put him back on the shelf, and, it, and, it's, and then it's on to lunch in our managed lives, largely nodding at Jesus when we sit down to eat, but ignoring the Spirit who lives in us, who desperately wants to work in us and through us to reach the lost. See, some, some people have no knowledge of Jesus. And Paul's, Paul's daily death was this, again, a, a mental and emotional embrace of the reality that if he went out the door and started talking about Jesus, he could die. He could be killed for that. And yet he willingly did it. He, he willingly put himself in that place. He puts the exclamation point in this line of argumentation by telling his readers, if there's no resurrection, don't do this. But, if there, but the inverse is true, right? If, there, if the resurrection is real, go, make it known to people. Christians, under the sound of my voice, listen to me. You have to choose right now today whether you're going to die today so the gospel can go forward or whether you're going to live for yourself. That's the choice you have. And you can eat and drink and go on with life as if nothing really matters or, th- or this could be your last day on earth. Would that be so bad? To, to wake up in the presence of Jesus? Do we really believe that that's better? I wonder sometimes if we really believe that that's the better thing. Because some people don't have any knowledge of Jesus. That's astounding to me. The resurrection of Jesus is the single greatest event in history. Bar none. And salvation is such a gracious gift that no one, even if they devoted themselves to ponder the concept of grace for a hundred years, could not grasp its enormity. And we get that. We have received it. We just generally don't seem all that interested in giving it to others. Some people have no knowledge of Jesus. And you could come in here and sit every Sunday. We could have a worship service seven days a week. And everyone religiously attending every day, faithfully and shouting, Amen! at the right moment when the pastor says good things and, and singing loud and on and on. But, but if we really believe the gospel, that the resurrection of Jesus happened and that we who put our hope and faith in Jesus will be resurrected to new life, how, how can we lack obedience in what Jesus has commanded us to do? Some people in Stanwood don't have any knowledge of Jesus Christ. That is offensive to me. Let me give you First Peter here. I got three scripture references here and I'm done. I promise I'm going to shut up and sit down. First Peter 3, 1 Peter 3. Blessed be the Lord and God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance. We've been talking about this this morning, right? It's imperishable. It's undefiled. It's unfading. It's being kept in heaven for you, who by God's power, even you are being guarded through faith for salvation that's going to be revealed in the last times. And in this, we rejoice. though, Though now for a little while, if necessary, and it is necessary, You have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold, even though gold perishes when it's tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him and you believe in him and you rejoice with a joy that's inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. What a blessed thought, church. What a, what a precious promise of what's to come for those who put their faith in Jesus. But we, and then we, we stop and we just think for a minute and say, well, what about those who've never heard? What about those who never believed the gospel? Because some people have no knowledge of Jesus. 
See, Paul would say to the Corinthian church in the next letter, which we won't get to this year, 2 Corinthians 5, he says, for the love of Christ controls us. Some translations read, the love of Christ compels us because we have concluded this. Paul says, one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live, who put their faith in Jesus, would no longer live for themselves, but live for him. That's the purpose. And we wouldn't live for ourselves anymore as Christians. We would live for Jesus. We would live for the propagation of the gospel. You're like, whoa, the love of God controls and compels us. That's a good thing. It's not like the love of God's not reckless. Yeah, I took a punch at the song. What? <laughs> What, what, what does it accomplish in us? What does the love of God do through us? What is it compelling us to do? That we who now live in Christ Jesus might no longer live for ourselves, but live for him in obedience to him and engage on the mission. Why would that be the outcome? Because, well, because some people have no knowledge of Jesus. And then John 11. John 11 says this, and we'll, and we'll pray and, and wrap up this morning. John eleven twenty one to 27, Martha said to Jesus, and Lazarus, their brother, died. You remember this episode in John 11. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had just been here, my brother would not have died. But even, but even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said, I, I, I know, I know that he's going to rise again at the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus said, Martha, I am the resurrection. I am the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die physically, yet shall he live. And everyone who believes in me shall never die. Do you you believe that? He puts it to her. Do you really believe this? And she said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. My question to you this morning is, church, do you believe that? Do you believe it? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world and through whom we are saved? Because if you do, you've got to go and tell the lost about this Jesus who died so that they may live. Some have no knowledge of Jesus. Father, we ask you for your grace and mercy. Not that so we could have a bigger offering or a bigger building or more people coming to our church or any of those things. We're asking you for your grace and mercy that you would transform our hearts from fearful about the gospel to faith-filled and courageous about the gospel. And we're looking around at a world that's spinning out of control and it's not just nations, it's, it's global and this whole thing just... It's lining up with prophecy and all these things are happening so quickly and it's so easy for us to be overwhelmed and and frightened. And we're asking you for a fresh filling of your spirit so that the church would engage on mission to make Jesus known. That's why we're here. So Lord, would you fill us again today? Would Would you renew our hearts today? We ask in your name. Amen. Church. We could sit here every Sunday and sing loud. We could meet for church seven days a week. We could engage our emotions in worship. We sing loud and give faithfully and shout amen. And if we really believe the gospel, that the resurrection of Jesus has happened and that we who put our faith and hope in him will be resurrected to new life, we cannot justify our lack of obedience to what Jesus has commanded us. Believe it or not, some people right here in our own town have no knowledge of Jesus. So go in the confidence and power of the Spirit who lives in you and pray, pray, pray for opportunities to make Jesus known to any and everyone who will listen. That is our high calling in Christ Jesus. Emmaus Road Church, you are sent.